Welcome to Samsung London. This is our uh, last embracing death and dying day for a little while. So make the most of it. You have to get it this time, you know. If you don't, <laughs> if you don't get it now, sorry. <laughs> Uh, we won't be holding one next year. We're going to give you a break because we feel that uh, we have had it every year now for four years and maybe you are starting to get a little bit bored because, of course, we have nothing new to say about death and dying. It doesn't change. <laughs> it's the same as previous death. It's the same as our grandparents' death, as our parents' death, as our children's death. Death is the way it is. Death doesn't change. So, uh, <clears throat> from that point of view, I have nothing new to say. I'm going to say the same as I said more or less last year and the year before. Uh, but, of course, it's good to have reminders. And um, for some of you who were not here last year also. So, I'm meant to talk about the Buddhist approach to death and dying. Buddhist approach to death and dying. And, and I would say, yes, Buddhism has a lot of wisdom to offer in terms of how to approach our own death. Wonderful, a wonderful amount of wisdom to offer. And a wonderful amount of wisdom to offer on how to live our life, because those two things go together. The more we get familiar with the fact of death, the more we sort of try to live our life to the full. Actually, knowledge about death and dying and impermanence is an encouragement to live our life joyfully and happily and, and well. It is not a sad message, even though, of course, there is often sadness connected to death. There is loss. So there is often pain, both uh, emotional and physical pain. Uh, you know, death is not normally a comfortable process. It is not normally a happy time for a lot of people. So there are all sorts of mixed emotions connected to death and dying. But the more we train and the more familiarity we have and the more acceptance we have around death and dying, the better we become at dealing with it when it happens, whatever form it takes. And that is something we don't know, right? We don't know how we are going to die. Never mind how much we have practiced, how, if we are Buddhist, how much meditation we have done. We don't know. What will our death be like? Will it be through sickness? Will it be through accidents? Will it be through old age, food poisoning, or <laughs> some sort of freak accident? We, we don't know. We just don't know. So that we cannot really prepare for. But uh, in, in terms of that wisdom that Buddhism has, if you look at it, impermanence, is underlying. Impermanence is the foundation of all the Buddhist teachings, the view of impermanence, the recognition that everything in our life is impermanent. There's nothing around us that is not impermanent. There's nothing around us that doesn't change moment by moment, instant by instant. So there is actually, uh, each moment we say that there is death and each moment there is rebirth. Each moment we have a new chance, another chance. So death, from that point of view, is happening all the time. But of course, when we, when we talk about death and dying, we talk about, tend to talk about the, the moment when mind and body separates. And that is a very important time. So in Buddhism, we say the better, the more training we've had during our life, we are more likely to have a peaceful death. The more acceptance we have of impermanence and the more training we, we have, we are less likely to have a lot of regrets, for example, of how we've lived our life. Because regrets is one of the things that come up a lot for people who are dying. 
And we don't want to die with regrets. We want to die without regrets. If we can, we want to die uh, with a state of mind where we don't look back and, and think, oh, if only I had done that differently. If only I had been better at this. If only I had been kinder to my parents. If only I had treated my friends more uh, sympathetically. We want to at least die with a peace of mind feeling that we did our very best and not to have too strong regrets. We want to die also with a mind that is not overwhelmed by fear, if we can. Because fear is also a very strong emotion that tends to arise when something so unknown as leaving our body, being separated from our physical form, when that happens. We have no experience of this. We have no, at least no memory of it. We might have many lifetimes. We may have, you know, been born and died many times, but we have no recollection of it. So that moment of leaving this physical anchor, it's quite scary. It is quite a frightening thing to think that our solid anchor, we will be drifting, we will have nothing there to, to hold on to, our body, this thing that we go to sleep at night, we come back and we're still here, you know, still here in this body. So that unknown, the unknown gives a lot of fear. So we say dying without fear is, if we are a good practitioner, meaning if we have done meditation and gained some inner stability, we might be able to die without regret and without fear. Because we have lived our life to the full. So we don't have regrets. We've lived our life to the full according to the ethics of our practice. And we have made the most of training our mind, made the most of the knowledge we have on our path in terms of training our mind. So then, hopefully, we will have at least less fear. And uh, then some, some people who are really advanced on the spiritual path, it says that they are able to die joyfully, without any regret, without any fear, but full of joy. Because they have come to the realization and recognition that there is no one there to die in the first place. There is no one there dying. There is, uh, as His Holiness the 16th Kamapa said when he died, he said, nothing really happens. He said to a, a student who was very upset and crying, he's to, to calm that student down, he said, nothing really happens with a big smile. And that was his own death he talked about. So the more we practice during this life, we, the better we should become at handling our own death and also the death of others, the loss of others. Because we have that clear understanding that everything that is born will die. Everything around us is impermanent. Our relationships are impermanent. However loved our dear ones are, both our, our family friends, our, you know, your partners, your children, spiritual friends, teachers, everybody will be parted in the end. So if we have that recognition, we can make the very most of the time we have together and with this acceptance that eventually we will all be parted, which means that there will be less pain when that happens. There will be less holding on. There will be less attachment and there will be less uh, suffering and sense of loss. The more acceptance we have of death and dying, the less pain there will be at that time. Then in terms of when we die or when someone else dies, what is also taught in the, like this Buddhist approach to death and dying, we say that we should try and create the 
the right environment. This is sort of looking at what can we do to have a good death. What does it mean to have a good death? You know, we don't really know how many people actually have a good death. It's hard to uh, truly assess. But, for example, if someone close to you uh, is dying and you have to help them to try and have a good death, then what can we do? And in terms of my own death, what can I do to have a good death? So it says we could try and create the right environment around that person. The environment is very important when we die. Who we surround ourselves with, what sort of place it is. Is it a place that will help us to be peaceful? Is it a place that will help us to uh, let go? Or is it a place that will stir up emotions and, and create more sadness? Like, do we, if we are surrounded by people who understand death, well, then we are more likely to have people who can, like, they will be able to support us at that time. They will be able to say the right things. They will be able to be there with kindness and compassion, hold our hand, and not talk about things that will stir up negative emotions not talk about things that will stir up more, uh, more sort of sadness, stir up longing or attachment to our close ones, stir up anger. When we think about relationships, like difficult relationships, that is something that comes up when people die, is that whatever we have not, whatever unfinished business we have, you know, we don't want to have anger and unfinished business follow us into the next life. So we want to resolve things before we die. So if we are surrounded by people who understand that, they can help us to resolve things. It's never too late to try and resolve. It's never too late to forgive others. And to, it's never too late to ask for forgiveness. So if, if we understand that, if we know the person who is dying, we can help them to have maybe a difficult conversation that will release a burden that they're carrying, if we know that. We can help them to, uh, to forgive if they're carrying a grudge for years and years and years. We can help them to make peace in that relationship. Or we ourselves can, can make that peace. We can ask for forgiveness. We can, uh, we can say to that person, I'm so sorry, I've, if I have ever hurt you, I'm so sorry I never intended to. If I have caused you any pain, I'm so sorry I never intended to. Simple words like that make a lot of difference at the time of death. They can just like release that knot that we have been tied up in. Maybe for many, many years, people have very, very difficult relationships. Say, for example, people have uh, separated, divorce, you know. First, people end up loving each other so much. But then when there's divorce, you see, if there's a lot of money involved, then you can really tell what happens because there's a lot of fighting, there's a lot of anger that develops, there's a lot of resentment. And that can be carried for years and years and years in that relationship. So before we die, we want to let go, we want to forgive. And so it's a matter of, are we the person who is dying or is it, are we helping somebody who is dying? So that's what we can do, that's what we can look at. Create the right environment by having, a, having them surrounded by the right people that will give them peace of mind, that will have some understanding of death and dying, that will know what is the right things to say and what is the wrong things to say. Sometimes when people are, are not familiar with death, they become very, very nervous in that moment. They feel they have to say so many things. They, they're afraid of silence when you sit with somebody who's dying. 
Sometimes all you have to do is sit and hold their hand and just be full of love. Show them, but you don't have to say very much to show that you love them. It's just being there is an expression of your love. That is much more important than just sitting and chattering away and trying to fill a silent space due to your own nervousness. So for the person who is dying, it is very important who we surround ourselves with because we say in Buddhism that the way we die, the emotions we die with, that is, they are very powerful. They are what are, they are like the catalyst for our ongoing journey. If you believe in rebirth and reincarnation, if you die with anger, that's not good. <laughs> try not to die with anger. Die, don't try not to die with resentment. Try not to die with jealousy or with a lot of negativity. Try not to die with a lot of grasping and attachment. If we look at, from the Buddhist way of seeing it, we say if we have very difficult relationships in this life, if there is somebody like one of your colleagues at work that is just really giving you a hard time, maybe that's, maybe it's because things were not sorted out in a past life. So it still continues. So we want to sort things out while we can now. And that's one of the things we, of course, while we are fully alive and have the strength and the energy, we want to do as much as we can. But even up until the moment of death, it's never too late. It's never too late to say, I'm sorry. It's never too late to show love and kindness. And at that time also, whatever we say, it becomes very uh, meaningful and powerful and honest. It's a very honest situation when you are with somebody who is dying, or when we are dying, or somebody who is dying. I have been with uh, somebody who is dying who, who had a situation like that and really wanted to clear things up. So it's a very... It's a moment that just a few words can mean so much and a few words can be so honest. So we should remember that in terms of not disturbing people who are dying, trying to be stable, have a stable environment, uh, not be overcome by our own grief because that doesn't help the person who is dying if we are filled with grief. And I think for somebody who is dying, if they can die... Uh, peacefully and without too much suffering. That is also a great gift for the people who are left behind because that gives others less suffering. The more suffering the person who is dying has, the more, the more pain it leaves the relatives with afterwards. Then we say that it's good to leave the body for at least four hours undisturbed after the, the person has died. So try to leave the body uh, just simply, if, if it's somebody who dies in a hospice or hospital, you can ask the, the nurses and doctors in advance. You should always ask them in advance. And uh, we have papers, I think, on our website and here that you can hand to doctors and nurses with information about that. In advance, in advance saying, I am a Buddhist or this person is a Buddhist and the traditional way is that we leave the body undisturbed for a minimum of four hours. Then the hospitals always try to do their best if they know in advance. If you don't tell them in advance, they usually have somebody waiting already. So then it's difficult because they're very busy. Um, that is because uh, to let the mind rest, to to try and, and give the person time to, you know, in, in it's, it, it's a whole, it, it's, it's got to do with the whole dissolution process after death. But that's something we can't really go into now. We say there is an outer dissolution process, there's an inner dissolution process at death. And that inner dissolution process may take a little while. So for that reason, we say at least leave the body for four hours. Now it used to be that that was a very common thing. When my grandmother died in Denmark, I remember her coffin was brought to us and 
sat there and we were all attended, you know, also in UK, all over Europe, this was a tradition. Now it's done less and less. But there was that period of, of peaceful resting of the body and saying goodbye. Everybody had a chance to say their goodbye. So I think that's very meaningful. It makes a lot of sense. And that is also possible in this country if we want it, if we, if we organize for that. That is possible. We have had a funeral here of one of our dear members. Uh, who we, Her coffin came to the center and was sitting in the shrine room the whole day. So there was people here, family and friends. And it seemed very, very meaningful way to, to have a, a funeral. So the right environment is important. The last, uh, the state of mind actually at the moment of death is very important. Um, and then we say, yeah, to try and encourage the right at- attitude, if we can, if we're familiar, if we're somebody who's supporting another practitioner or anyone really at the time of death, try and and encourage them to develop kindness, compassion. That is not just a, a Buddhist attitude. That is a universal attitude that benefits everybody, whether we are Buddhist or not. If we die with a mind uh, uh, thinking of others, trying to think of how many others are in a similar situation, I am not the only person who is dying. Feel compassion for others who are dying. Feel compassion for others who go through similar things as what I am going through now. This means that we also have less suffering ourselves if we can think of others. So it's a way of of guiding the person and uh, they will suffer less. And if with compassion, if we can die with compassion, there will be less suffering and um, gratitude, appreciation, having that recognition that death is natural and um, uh, it, is not, uh, it is not something happening only to me. It happens to everybody. Everybody who is born will die. So in Buddhism we have, um, yes, we have a lot of contemplations on death and dying. It is seen as a foundation for our practice to really integrate and assimilate an understanding of impermanence. So we think, contemplate, for example, the external impermanence, which is very obvious. We know, we all know that things are impermanent. But the, the, the problem is we don't live as if life is impermanent, even though we know. So by contemplating and thinking about it more and more, we integrate it. And it means that we appreciate more and more everything we have, and we want to make the most of our life. That should be the result of contemplating impermanence. The result of contemplating it is, sometimes initially it might make us sad, But the more we contemplate it, the more we recognize how much we have to be grateful for and to how we really want to make the most of the life that we have. So it's actually, it gives us a lot of joy, contemplation on death and impermanence. The result should be that we live our life joyfully and full of appreciation. So we can contemplate the impermanence of everything around us, external things, And we contemplate our own life, the impermanence of our own life. I could recommend, for example, if you're attending the meditation sessions that we have here today, is that you could do some contemplation like that when you sit down in the room with the coffins downstairs. Uh, Think about the impermanence of your own life. We say, me, I, my name, I am so and so, I am... Uh, you know, uh, I, have, I have a feeling that I am the same me that I was 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 20 years ago. Of course we are not. So contemplate how we have changed through our years. Contemplate our body. Think about this body that we will be 
leaving eventually. We'll go into a coffin similar maybe like that or however we plan to do it. That body that started out as a little baby has grown. A year later, another year, another year, ten years later, ten years later, five years later, up until now. Am I the same person? Is this the same body? And this body that has changed, of course it will continue to change. This body, what is it made of? Think about this body that we identify with so strongly and say, this is who I am, this body, is our, our most precious possession. Is this really me, this body? Is that who I am? This body, what is this body made of? This body is made of, well, we say the five elements. Everything is made of the five elements. But really, when we look at what this body is made of, it is, you know, the flesh and the blood and the bones and the, all the sort of less attractive things that are there. We're still so attached to our body, isn't it? All the things that go into the toilet, is that me? That's my body. <laughs> you know, that's also my body, isn't it? If I think my body... That's me. So that is what we are separating from. But that is also what we are so afraid of separating from. That is what we are so attached to. We do so much to look after our body, which is a good thing. We should look after our body. It's precious in every sense of the way. If we use it well, it's very, very precious. But coming to some recognition of this fragility of life and the uh, impermanence and the non-solidity of all of it is very much part of the Buddhist view that our body is not so solid after all. I cannot find anything there that I can call me or mine. We say it's made up of the five elements. The solids is the, the blood and the bones, the, the water, so the earth element is the solids. The water element is all the liquids the blood and everything else, the water and the urine and all of that. Uh, so uh, earth, water, fire. Fire is the heat element. You know, the digestion. And we get hot, we get cold. Air element, our breath. And also the movement in the body, the growth. The growth, that's when we are growing from keep getting taller, taller, uh, you know, getting older, older. The element, we get, get older and shorter and shorter as we get older. So air elements and the space element, we say it's like all of the cavities in the body. That's who I am, is it? Is that who I am? My body. That is what I'm separated from at the time of death. So it's good to get some familiarity rather than just my body as the surface of what's there. And uh, we have so much grasping and attachment, like in relationships, so much grasping and attachment to the body, our partner's body. Then after a while, when we get to know the partner better, then maybe there's less attachment. But So was that attachment just to the body, to that attachment to these elements? These type of contemplations, you, you should do them. You don't have to sit formally in meditation to think about impermanence and to think about the impermanence of the body, but it's good to do it because then we are less afraid. We have more acceptance of death. And um, then we think also, uh, try to imagine how would my death, what would happen or how might my death what form might it take? How might my death happen? All the different possibilities. I could die in a hospital. I could die of illness. I could have an accident. I could die just of old age. If I was lucky, I could die of old age still with my senses intact and clarity of mind and joy in my heart. But it may not happen like that. I could die in the hospital plugged up to lots of tubes and unconscious where I don't have a chance to say the last words to my relatives and I don't have a chance to do or make right the things that I didn't manage to make right. 
So try to contemplate these things. We, try to sh- we tend to shy away from it because we're a little bit uncomfortable with it. But if you really think about it, you will feel more at ease. You will gradually, gradually become more accepting of death and death will not be such a, a you know, an alien thing. So contemplating what happens at the time or what might happen at the time of death, we also contemplate then what happens to our body, this body, when after I'm di- after I have died. What happens to this body after I've died? How do other people relate to this body after I have died? How do I relate to dead bodies? We, we, we shy away from, we get frightened. We, we go, ooh, ooh, that's not my mother anymore. Or, that's not my partner anymore. So thinking and contemplating that, that, I would recommend you to do that when you go to, if you go to any of the meditation sessions. And also generally in your life that you, you dare to think about it. And uh, it is not something morbid, it is simply part of life. Life and death are the two sides of a coin, as they say. We cannot have one without the other. We have to accept both, and ideally we would be able to die joyfully. Ideally we would be able to die without regret, without fear, and with joy, feeling that our life was really well spent. Our life uh, was full of goodness and we have used it for a lot of benefit for others. That's a key thing is that by contemplating death we make the most of life. And you can see that when people, uh, certainly practitioners, that's what I have experienced. I don't have so much experience with non-Buddhists but uh, I imagine it's the same in all faiths really. But I have seen it with Buddhists. When they when, uh, if people are told they have cancer or they have a certain time left to live and this is terminal, like the doctors cannot do anything anymore, initially there is a period of time where, you know, we would rather not die, of course. We would rather have a long, good life and that everybody, we should wish, for, wish that for everybody. But if that happens, then after the initial shock, that person comes to a certain, it's like a wake-up, wake-up call. And every moment becomes so precious for that person. They are awake in every sense of the word and and every moment of the day. I've seen that when when I was in retreat in Samuel Ling, there were several people who came to our retreat and stayed in our retreat because they they were in that situation and they got to spend their, like some of them, a uh, few months up in retreat before they got, they were so bad that they needed hospice care. And that was how, what we could see, they were shining. You know, they were dying, but they were shining. They were so full of joy to see another sunrise. They were so full of love for everyone around them because they knew how precious every moment was. And we could say that we should all be like that, really. Because we don't know if we'll be dead tomorrow. We don't know if we'll be dead in two months. We we don't know if we even have six months left to live. So if we had really integrated that truth of impermanence, we would live every moment so full of radiance and appreciation. That should be the result of it. So I have my watch here, and uh, there's a few minutes if you'd like to ask any questions. Yes? I think it's a good question because it's very, very relevant uh, uh, these days, you know. The Buddhist view is that 
uh, it's very sad. It's very sad to end your own life. And also, it's not the end of suffering. Um, death is not the end of suffering. Now, I know you're saying that for the sake of your family and your relatives, you would do it. But the Buddhist view is really that death is not the end. So euthanasia is not an answer. And also that death, uh, sorry, that life is very precious. Whether you have uh, dementia or not, life is very precious. And I think euthanasia is, uh, I, I, I get very sad thinking about or hearing about people who, you know, who make that decision. I think it is such a sad uh, uh, approach because life is so precious and I'm sure that uh, also for your family, you are precious even if you have, you, even if you have uh, dementia. Even if you have to be looked after till the end of your days, this, this is, should be out of love for our parents. We should be able to look after them. Out of love for our children or for our close ones, we should be able to care for them whatever they are suffering from, whether it is a terminal, terminal illness or not. We should not just choose an easy way out. That's, uh, and we did, uh, if you say traditionally the Buddhist, you say, we say that they are, our body is filled with dakas and dakinis and Buddhas in all the cells of our body, and by ending your own life, you would be ending their lives. But that is more sort of, I think, a metaphorical image. But uh, our, we also say that ultimately we are a deity. By ending your own life, you are ending the life of a deity or of a Buddha. So it is a very negative thing to do. That's the Buddhist view I'm giving you. I'm not saying you have to take that view, but that is the, generally the Buddhist view. So I think we have to end here. And it's very nice to see you all and uh, enjoy, enjoy the rest of the death and dying day. Yeah. Thank you.